So this is week nine, and we're looking at uh, landscapes designed for public housing. And this is surely where some of the most significant landscape memories are formed by residents, and especially the children living here. So in this series, we've heard about Alexandra Road Park, and last week about Michael Brown's Brunel Estate, designed with so much attention to detail that seemed to go unnoticed by site managers and so on. And, an and another site, you know, that's faced the brink and was brought back uh, with the help of determined residents. Um, our objective with these talks is to raise awareness about the work and the ideas and thinking of the original designers and also how these sites are now looking and functioning and to see what we can learn from this and take forward and to find out more about where the relevant archives are and what makes these places still so very special. We've uh, been very fortunate in getting a range of fascinating speakers uh, who've accepted our invitation to focus in detail on each one of the post-war designed landscapes and gardens added to Historic England's list last year. And for a number of subjects, we are lucky enough to have two speakers as in tonight offering different viewpoints. So this evening, we're delighted to welcome, first of all, Elaine Harwood. She is Senior Architectural Investigator with Historic England and undertook some of the uh, organization's research on the post-war landscapes added to the Garden Register in 2020. She's also author of Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn, published by the RIBA with the 20th Century Society in 2011. So over to you, Elaine, please. Thank you. I hope you can all see the screen. Let me, there. Um... <laughs> it was working there we go so let me start by introducing some of the characters uh, involved in golden rain in particular jeffrey powell who's primarily responsible for the landscape aspect um and one of the three partners in chamberlain powell and bond who met working in the late 1940s teaching at the Kingston Department of Architecture at the Kingston School of Art. This is obviously a later photograph kindly supplied by his daughter Polly. Um, and Powell had studied at the Architectural Association. As a military family, he was destined for a military career. But in 1937, he contracted tuberculosis, and he lost a kidney, and therefore had to start thinking suddenly of a new career. Good drawing, and his family suggested, what about architecture? And so he was that unusual generation who was at the Architecture Association during the war. They were um, evacuated to Monk and Hadley at the northern tip of London, north of High Barnet. And they, he shared a house with uh, fellow students, most notably Philip Powell, no relation whatsoever, and for, uh, Hidalgo Moya, who would sim similarly uh, excuse military service, either because they were unfit or in Ma Moyer's case, he was an American. And they, their tutor was Frederick Gibbard, uh, again, somebody with severe health problems at times, and, uh, and so unfit for active service, was, um, I think, part-time air raid warden for a bit, but was... Uh, teaching at Monk and Hadley, introducing his students to uh, historic buildings in the area, getting them to make surveys, looking at landscape. Gibbard himself was studying for his town planning qualifications at the same time, when he wasn't ill, he was an absolute workaholic, it's amazing. Um, but in 1943, the three friends, Powell, Powell and Moyer all start to work for Gibbard, uh, working on his big housing for the uh, British Iron and Steel Federation. And Geoffrey Powell stayed on until 1946. And so worked on this little estate, not now well known, but it did win one of the 
Festival of Britain Awards in 1950 for some of the best new architecture of the late 1940s, the Somerford Estate, which is in Dalston, um, just west of Hackney. And it's not been terribly well maintained, but you get the series sense here, series of squares surrounded by privet hedges and these little fences that are origin, original and offering a mix of housing and flats of various sizes and scales, all sort of linked together by little pedestrian pathways. And um, meanwhile, Peter Chamberlain, always known as Joe after the politician, was, um, I think, became the, the sort of leader of the group that uh, was started a degree in uh, Oxford University, withdrew during the war as a conscientious objector and worked for ambulance brigades in London. And during that time, his wife, Jean, um, sister of childhood friend who who come up with the name Joe, uh, encouraged enrolled him for a course at Kingston School of Art, and so began his interest in architecture. And on qualification, he carries on teaching at Kingston and working in partnership with the leader of the course, Eric Brown. And they go on to design the Seaside exhibit. Most of their projects were exhibition designs. And chief among them was this, um, the Seaside element of the Festival of Britain on the South Bank with these sort of different levels, um, as well as the sort of masts and so forth. And you can just see the old, the original facade of the Royal Festival Hall on the far right hand side. And finally, here is a group of students at Kingston with the third member of the team, Christoph Bonn, who was Swiss, the son of hoteliers, and uh, he'd worked in Milan before coming over to Britain and he'd been headhunted to teach at Kingston. But by the early 1950s, this little group and a couple of other friends were beginning to get bored with um, their work at Kingston and the bossiness of Eric Brown. Jeffrey Powell said to me, you know, we felt it was him or us. One of us had to go. And so when the City of London Corporation came up with a, a competition for a housing estate on the very northern tip of the city at Golden Lane. It is ever for key workers. They, Powell suggested each of the three have a go. There were originally five, but the other two dropped out and didn't submit schemes and one of them went back to Canada. Um, and so they thought Powell's theory was that if they submitted three schemes, they'd have a better chance of winning. And if any of them won, they would form a partnership. So this is the site, the city down at the bottom. You can just see it up here, the railway line going through um, what's now Barbican Station, coming through to Moorgate. Here is the original street, Barbican. And the corporation had a long, very fine history of building housing, most of it well outside the city. Uh, but it recognised in 1951 that it needed to build some housing close to the city for key workers, policemen, nurses, caretakers, 
uh, and so on. And it first looked at this site down here, which says zone for commercial, Bridgewater Square, but the land was too expensive. And so it settled on this site. The city boundary goes through what well, or did until 1994, right where my, my I'm pointing the cursor. This site was then Finsbury. Uh, working class in the London bar. And the city was anxious not to have to accommodate too many of the Finsbury population. Uh, and this sort of obviously set up fuel with the uh, with the bar. And eventually I think 55 flats were designated for Finsbury residents. But to keep out the large working class families, most of the, the brief was mainly for one and two bedroom flats with a community centre, um, some facilities, as you'll see, for children, but it, it, it was mainly aimed at couples, probably with a small, ch small child, uh, rather than for big families. Uh, this is the site in more detail. If you know Golden Lane, they, it's just north of the present day Barbican. And you'll see that some of these names, Great Arthur Street, Bayer Street, Basterfield Street, Hatfield Street, are all recognised in the blocks of flats that were eventually built. But other blocks took their name from the sort of leading figures in the corporation, Bowater, um, Cuthbert Hammering, and uh, Stanley Cohen, chiefly. But you, more of that and on. The street pattern is curious, isn't it? I love hot water court uh, down here in particular. I hope you can see all this clearly. And it, it had been Golden Lane itself is a ancient thoroughfare from well, from the 16th century, if not earlier, on the edge of the city. And it had been developed with very short terraces of housing around sort of 1700 onwards, uh, and really very piecemeal way. And that's reflected in the street pattern, even though by the late 19th century, the whole area had been redeveloped with warehouses and had become the centre of the rag trade. There was a fire in 1897, and again in uh, the Blitz, particularly May 1941, the whole area burnt merrily with so much uh, consumable fabrics and so forth. And what was left was the space, the site, you know, it's the biggest totally destroyed area in London, really, as a product of the war, you know, everywhere north of St. Paul's, largely derelict. Uh, Rosa McCauley sort of commemorated it in her novel, The World, My Wet Wilderness. And um, I think this aerial photo from about 1952 shows it really pretty well, how only the basements essentially survived of much of the older warehousing. The, the um, Whitbread's Brewery survives pretty well up here. Uh, you can see Finsbury Circus. This is during Crescent. The proto origin of the Crescent in the Barbican today, there is the street Barbican. And our site, Golden Lane, is up here, completely covered over in rubble, which had been dumped as the fire brigade and salvage crews had cleared streets of debris after the after the bombing and I think you see that particularly well in this image here so there's sort of one block left standing and they estimated that it would take three years to shift all this debris 
Uh, you can see the artillery ground over here, Butcher's Row. Um, there's Whitbreads. This is be what becomes Barbican today and, um, and so forth. The Peabody Flats here surviving really pretty well indeed. And so I think the city surveyor had produced a scheme that it was the corporation decided instead to hold a competition. This is Powell's submission, a series of squares, as you see on the left there, very like what he'd produced for with Gibbard at the Summerford Estate. And in March 1952, he was declared the winner. Um, he had quickly to pro provide a perspective produced by another architect friend in Baker, who goes on to work with Leonard Manasseh. And you see it was all rather stumpy central 10 storey tower. So well within the London County Council's building height regulations of the time and surrounding it, a series of courtyards looking in. And the assessor, Donald McMorrin, admired the scheme because it had this rather village-like quality. And as Powell himself said, it was deliberately designed to turn in on itself rather than look out on that debris and detritus and bomb damage that was all around it. And you see, like the Summerford Estate, a series of on all flats, because it's a high density, 200 persons per acre, again, to meet the London County Council requirements. But it, it's um, various heights. And in the middle, there's a community centre, which was part of the brief. It was also part of the brief that the old street pattern could be swept away. Uh, there was no requirement for parking originally, nor for laundry facilities, just a community centre uh, and housing. And here is Powell showing the city councillors uh, the, the scheme. There he is pointing at that perspective you saw a moment ago. Apologies for the quality of this, but I, I'm very grateful to Otto Somery Smith for supplying it. And this one, too, which is rather later, showing the completed scheme being stared at. I think a delegation from Eastern Europe. I mean, it, it really couldn't be from anywhere else, could it? But you, you see how the tower has got taller. It's gained this top knot of water tanks and a roof terrace. And the site has grown from um, 4.7 acres on Golden Lane itself over here, northwards and then westwards to Goswell Road. And this like change in style in these later blocks becomes evident as we shall see. Here's a picture of the estate as first the first phase on its completion in 1957 at that southwest corner before this colonnade was partially filled in to deter non-residents from walking through. There's a big sign saying private estate now, but um, you can still walk in and enjoy those series of little squares. And here is the completed scheme as viewed from one of the towers of Barbican, with thanks to James Davis, Historic England's chief photographer. And you see how these blocks have got taller, but between them, you still have uh, squares, there's essentially four of them, with a sort of circular bastion as a feature, we, all that remains of the sort of through driveway of that the first competition scheme and the centrepiece, Great Arthur House, became briefly, when completed in 1957, the tallest residential block in London. The London County Council started to um, 
waive its restrictions on building heights in 1955-6, rather than abolish them completely, it was started to issue waivers because it had given itself permission to build the Shell Centre uh, to fund its development of the South Bank after the Festival of Britain. And that triggers this sort of po policy of nodal towers at regular points, at nodal points by parks, always looking to try and limit the cast of shadows that it would fall. And, and you see, this is Golden Lane here. On the um, left is Goswell Road, and you're looking up towards Islington and Highgate. Uh, and here's my badly drawn plan of the whole thing. So here is that main axis leading to a circular feature. There's the community centre, the main house, Great Arthur House in yellow there, the two roads, and this is that later phase here. And eventually there was car parking introduced under one of the squares. The workshops and Richard Kelsey School have recently re been demolished and a new block of flats, the private block, is going up here now. And you see children's playground over Tenants Hall uh, and two largely green areas, uh, tennis courts originally intended as a bowling green. And here is that um, what you see from the south, from Fan Street, is largely the paved courtyard over the car park and there's the ramp that goes down to it. And this lower block here and then behind it, Great Arthur House suitably clad in yellow Muro glass, the latest um, a paint glass forming a curtain wall recently renewed. And this picture taken on Saturday shows the current state of things, how the, these changes in level, providing not only a basement car park, but also using the basements of those old warehouses that had been bombed on the site, using that there's already dug down depths, not only for that tree, but also to provide stores and workshops, but mainly stores underneath this concourse to the main blocks. And you'll see changes in level, just as in the Festival of Britain, incredibly important to the site. And this is looking down at that car park block and at where I was standing, taking my picture right down here in the bottom corner. This is looking from the roof of Great Arthur House. Another colleague at Historic England, Chris Redgrave, took these pictures and there's that tree again. So you can see it's a very complex series of levels made into a real pattern when looked down on from above. And here, looking again from the roof uh, across the, the first, and I think perhaps the most interesting of all the courtyards, there's that old open colonnade I showed in the old photograph, now blocked. You can just uh, tuck in there uh, and come and enjoy the space with its um, little pond and stepping stones and a series of sort of grassy courts mixed in with rose bushes and um, paving. Uh, and Jeffrey Powell commented that the courts are turfed and laid out in a pattern with paving slabs. If it wears out and only grows weeds, there's a strong enough pattern to keep it together. And it sort of reflects this sort of robust, rather humorous way in which he spoke and but went through life altogether. Here's the same courtyard as it was in 1957 from what's left of the, of the Chamberlain Powell and Bond archive. Jeffrey Powell told me delightedly, and oh, we tip the archive in the skip, 
when we closed the Chamber in Power and Bond office in 1983. Luckily, Christoph Bond and the younger partner, Frank Woods, saved what material they could. So there aren't many drawings, there aren't any drawings for this. Um, there are some photographs, the original competition drawings were held by the corporation, uh, and the, what's left of the archive is now at the RIBA, but it's totally uncatalogued, it's just sitting there. But when it was held by Frank Woods in his garage, which means all the slides have rotted away, we do have, uh, he very kindly um, allowed English Heritage of as it was then, um, basically me and James come and photograph the drawings and photos, but there was very little indeed on Golden Lane. So this is that courtyard looking back at the community centre with Great Arthur House in the background. And you can see again how it's exploiting that sunken level. You know, ground level is where the cars are in the scene through the windows there. And I think it reminds me of not only the Festival of Britain, where near contemporary Peter Shepherd was playing with similar patterns of grass and bedding. But in particular, I think the work of John Cannell Clays, um, which Shepard goes on to publish in his Modern Gardens in 1954, with the, the paving and the little pools, and rather ordered arrangement of landscaping. There's no sense here of bringing in an outside landscape architect, as you'll find with Churchill Gardens as well. Both pals were absolutely adamant they were doing the gardening themselves. And the, uh, oh, while Chamberlain and Bond took on a lot of the building side of Golden Lane, the, the landscaping was pals and he was a very keen gardener, um, had a house down in Ham, Petersham way, where he, I think gardened absolutely extensively. And this is that garden and it survived better than, than Powell, I think, would have hoped. After the buildings were listed in 1997, Jeffrey Powell and Christoph Bond were still alive. They died very close, very suddenly, very close uh, together in late 1999. And, but for a couple of years, they were involved in the restoration of the estate. And it's now looking tired again, but they were involved in bringing the colours back to the estate the landscaping really hasn't changed very much at all. What does change is the amount of effusion of pots and so forth that the residents have introduced to the estate. And there is that view from 1957 taken again last weekend. Um, and I think really holding up remarkably well and looking down at it. And this funny little area is the other side of the block. This is the little bit you look down at from the street on the south side, Band Street. Now, Jeffrey Powell's um, first wife, Philippa, was, I think in the beginnings of dementia when I met her, I'm sure her family won't mind my saying that, but she was convinced this rather cross-shaped plan commemorated their child who would um, die, Sam, who died a cot death. Um, and she, 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 she was very emotional about this. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I thought I should share it with you because it's quite a, a, a striking feature. There's two of these, but this is the most cross-like part of the scheme of, again, turf and paving on the south side. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
sorry, on the south side of the whole estate. So visible from the street outside. And as you go through the um, Bumfan Street, you walk through this sort of small area for car parking uh, and deliveries with the entrance to Great Arthur House on the left and ahead of you uh, on the right, the community centre and where we've just been looking, but ahead of you there's a second courtyard between Bear and Basterfield houses and this dominant surface of one circular feature. And it's, this was in the competition entry as a cross axis, but it's been truncated as built and instead finished with this sort of gates all locked. But a bastion, I think in the 18th century manner, because certainly Powell knew his um, historic buildings and historic landscapes. He'd been taught by Gibbard uh, to have a thorough understanding of 18th century architecture and landscape. Uh, and this sort of dominates the little greensward between uh, Bayer House and, and Basterfield House. And here it is looking down. And the early drawings do show a similar pattern of paving. And I don't know if that's all gone, which is why you've got this rather spotty if it were grass, or not, if I don't know if it ever happened, it suggests, I think, this photo that for a time there was um, the same idea of paving and turf as in the earlier quad, but it was all then grassed over. And certainly, Jeffrey Powell was very adamant that there was this one tree. Uh, there's it looking more sensibly, brought in from Hilliers, which then died, and a tree was duly replanted in the 1990s. And Powell was very keen on those sort of colours with the black of the Stanley Cohen house here, contrasting with the dark reds, very similar to the use of strong colours in the work of Gibbard with his... Um, and in Steel Federation housing, and with Paolo Moyer's own work at Churchill Gardens. Which again, there was some restoration done after the listing, but rather less than here. And again, a change in levels. My bike is tethered at ground level, but the actual garden is sunken, and that separates it, the public domain, from what the resident, the private, which the residents can enjoy. And if that reminds you of the Chamberlain Powell and Bond's later planning at Barbican, well, here's the origins of it. And the part of the point about Golden Lane is the way that um, the two schemes together chart the whole development of public housing from 1952 to 1982 when Barbican is finally finished. Here's looking down again. Yeah, you see that patterning is very intriguing. Until I've seen all these photographs, I didn't know that any of it had actually been realised. This block, housing was replaced in the late, in the scheme in about 1957, when the estate was ex plan was extended with a recreation centre. There was eventually, originally going to be a swimming pool at Barbican, which didn't happen apart from a pool in the girls' school. And instead, badminton courts were planned here, one of which was then, instead of a badminton court, later scheme put in swimming bath as built and completed in 1962 again with Powell as the architect partner in charge here 
uh, bowling green shown in earlier proposals, certainly in 1957, still planned as a bowling green, but as realized as tennis courts. Here's the pool. Again, sunken, you, the levels get particularly complicated here. Tennis courts, looking back at Great Arthur House, there's the pool and um, there's a walkway at this high level, then you can drop down uh, and, or continue round along this higher level on top of a tenant's hall. So enough more community facilities now mainly given over to sports users with on the roof, a small playground intended mainly for small children. And here it is originally with a paddling pool, slides and so forth, and a little bastion for keep ball games, sort of keeping them all well inside. Now, uh, a little playground for the smallest, smallest children. And this, again, is street level. So you're coming down again with so the fencing to keep the ball in um, isn't obtrusive. And you see the tenants hall now largely in gym use. And here it is today with that paddling pool still there. The stepping stones are still there, but replaced by turf and some rather nasty, vicious looking uh, playthings for those little tots. And behind, can you see these very tiny gardens for the very smallest bedsits? This is Hatfield House. This is the sort of first extension to the site for um, gold, the Golden Lane Estate added in in 1954, uh, so still in the same style, uh, with ma two stone maisonettes over tight bedsits. But these bedsits have other lovely little courtyard gardens. Yeah, you see, as you see here, completely enveloped and overgrown and next to it there's a site that's become the residence allotments and you can borrow books and that the sort of um, residence association it seems to be extremely active and this is looking across at Great Arthur House before the cladding system was uh, replaced uh, with on the roof another garden for the tenants of Great Arthur House with stepping stones and a pool. The water tank and lift system is shielded by this great canopy with viewing platforms. And of course, this very large pergola. Here's an older photo taken by me, you can tell because it's crap. Um, and beds overgrown. It was closed in 1981 when there was a suicide. So it's been so sort of fossilized ever since. I suspect, yeah, this is where the view has changed with this new block of flats going up. But you can see where this was landscaped by Joe Chamberlain. And here, um, trees were intended in these sort of pits, which were then partly paved over. And uh, again, the roof of the last phase, Crescent House, with series of shell roofs reflecting changes in architectural styles and taste, but showing how um, residents can add their own gardening touches. And I thought this picture sort of showed the contrast in styles, how over the course of the 50s, the bright colors, the curtain walling, the bright colours of the festival style 
updated with the introduction of aluminium glazed curtain walling, where you have clear and opaque glass covering the facades of the building, gives way to this heavier aesthetic of sh concrete, shell roofs, tiled surfaces, a whole heavier genre inspired by Le Corbusier. Again, Powell said Le Corbusier was what they were really looking at by the 50s, uh, and particularly the Maison Jao, the scheme from 1954-6 at uh, Neuilly on the edge of Paris, where Corb had taken the sort of ideas he'd seen in India planning Chandigarh, the new town in the Punjab, and looking at board marking, rough construction, a sort of Indi modern Indian vernacular, really, uh, but transported and crafted in a semi-luxury development for two brothers on the edge of Paris. And it had, was reported by Jim Sterling in the Architectural Review in January 57. And it had a much more profound influence in Britain than anywhere else. And you see this sort of arched construction in filled with brick. And a lot of the new university buildings that followed on, uh, a little bit in Sterling's own work and very well seen, but crafted to a far higher degree in Crescent House, which is the last phase of uh, the Golden Lane estate completed in 1962. I think uh, Joe Chamberlain, partner in charge, the assistants included Michael Nayland, who goes on to work at Bishopsfield, rather brutalist estate in Harlow, who won, and Michael Nayland and Bill Unglis, two assistants in Chamberlain, Powell and Bond, go on to repeat Powell's formula that if they end, do two separate entries, one of them might win, and then they form a partnership. And that's what happened there. So it's a continuing story. And here, Crescent House anticipates the heavy aesthetic, you know, from Barbican, which begins to the right of this photo on the other side of Fan Street. And here is a, a group of listing team and elderly architects looking round the Crescent House, the internal courtyard at the southern end of that block, which widens out to the south, and how it's been planted up by its residents. And to leave you uh, as aerial view showing how um, there is Golden Lane, look how tiny it is, seven acres in total compared to the vast scale 2000 flats art center school guildhall school of music and drama that follows from 1955 once chamberlain powell and bond had got their foot in the door working for the city they then could come up with proposals once um the city starts to rethink its commercial ideas for commercial office buildings in this part of the city. And I wanted to point out how formal the landscaping remains in Barbican with its rows of trees, just as their layout of Golden Rain had been formal. And I'll leave you with this quote, again, from Geoffrey Powell, from an architectural association journal in 1957, uh, looking back at, got at the landscaping of Golden Lane. There is no attempt at the informal in these courts. We regard the whole scheme as urban. We have no desire to make the project look like a garden suburb. On the contrary, we want to make it look urban. Therefore, you will not find large areas of grass within formal groups of trees. The whole thing is rather rigid. Thank you all. 
And I'll pass you over to Annabelle and to Clem. Thank you very much, Elaine. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> my head's buzzing. <laughs> well, before before I um, lose my head, I, I will leap on to introduce Clem and then we'll have some questions afterwards. Thank you very much. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Clementine Cecil. She is an architectural historian, campaigner and writer. And in the early 2000s, she was Moscow correspondent for The Times. And in 2004, co-founded MAPS, the Moscow Architecture Preservation Society, that published several reports about threatened heritage in Russian cities, including Moscow, St. Petersburg and Samara. She was director of Save Britain's Heritage and Save Europe's Heritage from 2012 to 16, and Pushkin House London uh, from 2016 to 2020. She's recently finished a book about wooden neoclassical city mansions in Moscow that will be published next year. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clementine. The floor is yours. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, right, I'm gonna just do the share, screen sharing. Um, uh, right. Um, and now what I need to do is do full screen. There we are. Thanks a lot um, for the introduction, Annabelle, and thank you for inviting me to speak about one of my favourite places on earth. And Elaine, thank you so much for that fantastic and extremely stimulating talk. Um, we residents of Golden Lane were all so excited when you wrote your book about Chamberlain, Bonn and Powell and, read, and all immediately acquired copies and read it um voraciously and felt very um pleased that the place was being acknowledged and um documented as we felt it should um elaine's touched on a lot of the um a lot of the things that make it a wonderful place to live i'm not in golden lane right now um i'm in another part of london I don't live in golden lane at the moment i lived there for 10 years but i'm still quite involved in it and you can see my flat here, um, I'm I'm on the third set of steps um, and the, the right hand flat, but I'll go on to show you some pictures. So in my brief talk, which is just 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about why it's a wonderful place to live and what the experience is of living there. Um, and uh, as we're talking about landscapes, I'm gonna speak as much as possible about that. Um, this I was first introduced to Golden Lane by by a Russian architect actually who was shocked that I didn't know it about uh, five years before I moved there in 2010 and I mean the Russians of course they uh, took on the garden city ideas very early and this isn't a garden city idea but but it shares some ideas and he was very interested this architect in the creation of a sort of utopian place, a, to and a total environment, and in many ways it is a total environment. And it's urban, but it's also village-like. Living there, I knew my neighbours well. I saw them go about their everyday lives and they saw me. The, um, the, the, and when, when you're there, you're unlike in uh, the countryside, living, living in an actual village actually, you're very aware in the kind of periphery of your vision all the time, you're aware of other people, uh, other people's lives. And the reason it's different from an actual village is because of all the glass and because of the landscaping um, that gives you quite extensive views almost wherever you are. Um, and so the three words to, that I would use to, to say why it's such a fantastic environment and incredible place to live and why it's so successful, the design is so successful, uh, that is the variety, and that's the variety in levels, which Elaine has um, described extensively and shown in some of those wonderful photographs, archival and present day, the porousness um, with the use of glass and levels, but mostly glass, and also the greenery. Um, I was fascinated to hear some of what Elaine was saying about the formality of the gardens. This is very true. They are formal, but as she's shown, and I will show more photos, the, it's the residents who have brought this softening to that formality. 
and a playfulness to these quite rigid environments. And, th and this, um, this gardening, this guerrilla gardening, um, the, the, these allotments, these pots, they're a wonderful counterbalance to the formality. And the greenery is a wonderful counterbalance to uh, the pink, that, that strange pink brick that he uses, which um, looks like it's very like the Corbusier Maison uh, Jao, which I didn't know, that color of brick. Um, so this is the, I'm, I'm gonna show you, there's a bit of overlap, but uh, that, that's okay. Um, as you walk through the estate, some of the variety in the environment is thanks to these different features, like the bastion, very formal. Um, I always found it the most difficult feature actually, because I don't know, I just found the, the texture of that brick quite difficult to cope with in a modernist environment. I didn't believe in it. It, it felt too artificial to me. But um, it's, I felt it was a nod to the city wall, and, but I was really interested to hear about the 18th century connection. It, it makes sense. Of course, the pavilion of the swimming pool, which is the most wonderful place to swim because you're swimming on the, on, on the level of the ground. You can see people walking by. Um, that's the sports center. Ooh, my thing's going a bit loopy. Um, and, then this, and then the tennis court, that's another feature. Um, Ooh, wrong way, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and the playground, which is this is before the changes that Elaine noticed. And then this is a photo from the Silver Jubilee a few years ago. And this uh, illustrates how the estate comes together for, for um, celebrations and how the landscaping lends itself to group activity. So Bastopfield Lawn, which I, I, you know what, Elaine, I think those might have been reflections. I think someone said that in the chat and I was thinking that when I was watching because having lived there and, and looked at that lawn, I never noticed any trace of paving. I could be wrong, but unless those photos were earlier and that that paving was from before 15 years or more. So it's, um, Bastopfield Lawn was a place of congregation because it didn't have the rose garden and fountain that you showed earlier in the other courtyard. Um, it's, it's, a big, uh, it's a big green space. And it was primarily designed for people living in Basterfield House to, to access, but it's, it's, it's um, also used by the rest of the community. Um, so this was an example of the community coming together. I had a very intense relationship with this tree that Powell insisted on, as you said, because I could see it from my bedroom window. Um, and I had, a, I had a bit of an issue with this tree because I felt it was a bit too formal in a way for, and also the colors is, as a coniferous, it didn't change, whereas other trees in the estate did. And that changing, the changing leaves seemed very important. Anyway, that's my personal relationship with this tree. But um, the porousness, um, this is going past the front uh, doors of Bassfield's house at so ground, ground level. This was, this was someone else's flat. But you could see into the kitchens and then just to the left, as you're walking by, there was another glass hatch into the living room. So you could see as you walk by how what people were up to if, if you wanted to. And so walking home from work, I would walk past my neighbor's windows and I give them away. Um, so there's a kind of intensity to living there. People know when know, know your business in a way. This is my sitting room. Um, the floor is not original. Um, that was changed before I got there. But the but um, what the other things you see here are the windows are. Um, now this shows the porousness, and this shows the relationship with the outside when you live there. So it's one of the ingenious things about the design. I never felt um, in any sort of uh, unease, uh, uneasy relationship with the environment, any kind of claustrophobia when I lived there. Even when I was ill and I would spend days there, I always felt like there was enough light and um, uh, enough light and space in the flat, despite their relatively small size. Um, and these, as you may have noticed in the photos, these flats have a double height sash window. So that on the left, that entry to the balcony is a double height aluminium framed sash window. Um, so it's a window that doubles up as a door. And also these cantilevered stairs, this is a maisonette, uh, which they share each step with the next door flat, also creating light in the flat um, because they're cantilevered 
and then this is upstairs in the bedroom looking out so you could see I could see the bedroom I could also see the top of the bath uh, of the barbican so here is a better view of the double height uh, sash window going out onto the balcony so the relationship with with the balcony and with the outside world is absolutely explicit in the design and in the experience of living on in this estate um, and uh, therefore it is irresistible to plant because you have a relationship with the outside world some other flats of the interior showing the relationship with the outside um, and uh, we planted pots um, and we planted so this was my garden that olive tree rooted on the left my neighbor's garden their silver birch rooted so there was a bit of gorilla gardening and I dread to think what it's doing to the communications on the estate the pipes and so on but um, mostly we mostly things were just in pots and it and one of my neighbors said imagine you're planting in a quarry it's dry there's a wind and quite a lot of sun and that's kind of what we had in mind when we were planting and tried to act accordingly he had a fig tree for example um just to finish on this is now a lost view because the residents there's a very act active resident association it's 49 percent council housing 51 percent private um the leaseholders are more active members of the resident association which is a problem it's that we, we everyone's always trying to work on that um a tower is now being built um in the foreground of this picture um so this is Basterfield from the back and that is a new introduction. This is it in a planning drawing. The City of London and Islington Council um, uh, built, it's a 14 storey social housing block and a school. There was a big uh, objection from Golden Lane because that's the view which we created the CGI uh, looking over the Basterfield lawn and how it loomed over. And originally that was intended for, it was a school for a long time, a one storey school and it wasn't intended for a high rise building in the original plan and the conservation plan, but the conservation management plan written by John Allen and Avanti Architects explicitly said that that should be a low rise area. So we objected, but we were unsuccessful and it is now going up. Um, but the, uh, the merits of that is an, are another debate entirely, but it was a very strong fight by the residents and it is it is a strong community um there are there are issues with the management but i i will i won't go into that i won't go into that now i'll, I'll finish there because i think i've gone over my time thank you elaine and clementine thank you so much for that absolutely stunning set of talks about an absolutely stunning part of london and to have again the duo of elaine introducing us to the architecture and then clementine taking us inside and looking out at the relationship between the building and the landscape i found absolutely gripping thank you so much um the the questions are mostly statements but they're interesting nonetheless and I expect most of you have read them but I will just run through them. Um, Annabelle was asking about research on Gibbard and Karen has come back saying um, an MA or PhD studies have been done in the past and and, and there was a little book in 20th century architect series that deserves, uh, it's being held up. If you look at Elaine's. Um, if you can see my there. screen, that's that one. It's in the same series as mine, which I also found for you. So, but I think I'm out of print, but this is a more modern book. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, let me just go back up to, um, <clears throat> yeah, Sasha was saying archive material being dumped in skips was common practice, something that makes us um, very sad. Um, and the debate about the patterning on the Busterfield lawn, um, I think it's a fascinating, again, a fascinating aspect of the whole landscape that um, archaeology and a light display can combine to, um, to make that little bit of a puzzle. Um, sorry, I'm just, um, I would also, if I may, um, Elaine, just ask a very boring question, um, 
while other people are thinking of far more interesting ones, but was it an issue, apart from the, what should you say, the social issues of working between the city and Finsbury Park, was having, was it a split client or did in fact the city run the, the competition and then the resulting contracts? The city ran the whole thing. It was aimed at people working in the city and um, it attracted a lot of married students as well as uh, married policemen and nurses. That was the sort of broad clientele. And there was a lovely piece in the Architects Journal when the building first opened saying tenants pay by cheque in Golden Lane. So it always had this ethos of being a cut above your normal working class tenant. And Finsbury Borough Council got very little look in. It could nominate, say, 50 tenants for the whole estate. And Clem, there must be what? Three or 300 flats or so there? Yeah, I think it's 350 something like that. So, so, um, so it, it was always sort of, as say, smarter than your average council estate, though, of course, not quite in the Barbican League, which is what keeps it sort of so much more humane, I think. Is that, is that balance um, still the same today or has that changed now? Well, Clem was saying, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about, I think it's about 49 uh, percent private 51 percent council housing but that might have changed a bit but it's more or less that but when we were going around like doing the petition against the tower we were going into all sorts of flats and there's a lot of poverty on the estate you know there's a lot it's a bit like London it's there's a, a contrast there's there's incredibly affluent people living there who love design and architecture and it's you know des res but there's also this poverty and that you know, and and that's also a problem on the resident association that you know there's there's a clash there's a sort of misunderstanding there's a gap in understanding so yeah yeah I noticed that too when with, with the communities um, the community hall borrowing that for the trade with power and bomb book launch and you know, there's it's full of old guys who just want to watch art on Sky TV and then you've got kind of you know, the, the architects and planners turning up, wanting to talk about culture. And it was quite a different, the, the two, two, it was of London at its most extreme in a way. Yeah. Quite, quite very enlightening. Mm. Yeah. Just wish I could afford to live there. You've had, I suppose there is an old population by definition because you've got to have an old tenancy to be able to, to afford it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty old. Question from Janet. Um, at the beginning, it was stated no laundry facilities. Did that change? The nearest laundry is in the Barbican. I, I don't know if there ever was a laundry along that row of, of shops in Crescent House. Possibly. That's the only place there would have been one. There's mm. certainly nothing in, no, in the... Um, provided as part of the estate. That was quite common. And when local authorities did put in laundries, uh, say Lewisham Council put put them in their post-war estates, they found that the take-up was really very small and that the use of the Bendix, as they were generally known, was really quite, quite that surprisingly limited. Implying that people had... Um, they were happy to yeah. hand wash. They yeah, hand wash, yeah. yeah. Until, the, until washing machines came in. I mean, my great aunt found going to the Bendix a real sort of big event. And um, great aunt. Uh, and that, uh, that was sort of in the 60s when they got a lot more common. I think they took a lot of getting used to. They weren't cheap and they weren't particularly easy. I mean, we all know as students how many socks you lost going to laundrettes, and I'm sure that they, that they did too. Um, I'm researching Gosport at the moment, and the council there provided spin dryers on the landings of all its blocks of flats, but not actual washing machines, and that's a new variant 
on this whole debate. But no, actual providing washing laundrettes was not a common thing. Mm, thank you. It's a, an interesting, the community facility of community washing um, facilities it has been around for well, thousands of years I imagine. Um, could I also ask one question you mentioned the glass cladding is that fairly modern and does it meet the current fire regulations? Well it's currently very modern indeed because it was redone two, last two years ago yeah, on Great Arthur House, the rest of the estate hasn't been done yet. Um, I don't I don't think it was ever a fire hazard, that the glass. Hmm. But, no, it um, just broke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but they're about to do Basterfield and to double glaze because they've double glazed Great Arthur. Um, there's been a lot of a lot of conflict between the residents and the City of London about it, but it's gonna happen all over the estate to because they're very cold, the flats in winter. They're single glazed and, but they are beautiful. You know, the glass goes straight into the wood on those windowsills downstairs in the sitting rooms and in the main rooms, beautiful. And then the rest are aluminium frames upstairs, but they've got howling gales coming through gaps and stuff. So it's kind of, I guess they have to be changed, but the 20th Century Society is part of the steering committee for that. But it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's gonna be a loss as well as a gain. I think it's it's really difficult to know what to do with those. It's, I suppose the new scheme's as good as it can be, but it's still a loss. But no, it met the fire regs of the time by be, the way the upstands work, and they incorporate a lip, so you've got the required height between floors to give you the um, the required fire eggs, which being London were always very stringent. Yes, and it, it's, was there any community involvement in the choice of materials, the choice of colours? Was that something that was imposed by... There was no community there till it was built, so no. I mean, sorry, with the modern cladding, the glass cladding, um, the replacement, the, um, the, the, the recent... Um, material choices was that a community thing a community involvement there was a consultation but i think we relied i think the community relied a lot on 20th century society um representing representing sort of best practice best conservation practice um because it's it's so very specific and that you know people don't have that kind of knowledge knowledge but um, there, is, there is quite a lot of involvement in, in, the, in these things, but as usual, it's all about the expense, you know, that's where the conflicts come in with the city. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a comment here from, from Roland, both Golden Lane and Barbican are heavily designated, all buildings listed, all garden spaces listed, um, hence being part of this um, series, and both in conservation area. However, the city is just consulting on a lavish new landscaping scheme for a large part of the Barbican podium that, whilst an interesting design, has nothing at all to do with CPB's ideas or designs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Question Can non statutory listing, pro can non -statutory listing protect landscapes effectively? Well, that's the debate for this, for uh, Gardens Trust and for all your specialists. I, I suspect, you know, it really does need more. It's a condition of the planning system, but it doesn't have a statutory protection in terms of heritage. So it's been looked to be changed, but the never, the, there's never been a window for legislation. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with that. Thank you very much. Unless there are any further questions, um, maybe I it's time to hand over to you, Annabelle. And thank you for those comments and questions, which are much appreciated. Annabelle, are you there? Thank yes. you. Yes, Helen, thank you very much. Well, uh, Elaine and Clementine, that was just a wonderful duo, <laughs> as Helen said, of sort of inside and out and backwards and forwards. It was... Um, it was just stunning, and I think it's. I think it. You probably knocked us all out a bit, <laughs> which is why there aren't more questions. 
um, I was shocked about, and I shouldn't be, about all the archives all being just thrown in the bin and somebody then fortunately thinking, oh, well, <laughs> let's not throw all of this away. But I think I suppose that often is the story. But good for those people to spot these things. Thank you for bringing this place alive to us all. I think we'll all have to go and um, leap out and visit it and tour around it and inspect it and all the rest of it. And I think that would be very interesting, actually, if we can do that next year. Um, so, Elaine and Clemmy, thank you very much indeed. It's been wonderful. And we're so pleased to have you now on film and, and on the record. <laughs> Thank you very much.